Of course the Sermon on the Mount is fiction. Jesus is fiction. The Gospels are fiction, so of course the Sermon on the Mount is fiction. But Dr. Richard Carrier does a very good job uh, here explaining to us why it is fiction. An example of this. this is Dale Allison, and this article has demonstrated this. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but this is an extremely elegant. This is the sermon, whole Sermon on the Mount diagram. It's extremely elegant chiasmus of multiply triadic structure. Uh, this is an, an elegant oration that was clearly written from beginning to end with careful attention to every single component. This is not some discourse that was just orally delivered from a hill somewhere. This is, this is a literary masterpiece. Uh, it's extremely elaborate structures. This is not oral, this is written. It's composed in Greek. It was, we can tell that it was originally composed in Greek. It wasn't translated from Aramaic or Hebrew. One of the reasons we know that is because it's dependent for a lot of its arguments and vocabulary on the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. We know Jesus wasn't walking around Galilee quoting the Septuagint and use, basing his arguments and stuff on the exact wording of the Septuagint. He would have been using Hebrew or Aramaic versions of the Bible. Uh, so we know whoever wrote the Sermon on the Mount was not Jesus. It was some uh, very expert Greek orator. Another reason we know that is because the entire thing, from beginning to end, assumes that the temple cult, the temple cult doesn't exist anymore, which makes no sense for Jesus. One of the most important things Jesus would have to say in this speech is, well, okay, this temple cult still exists. This is how you need to react to it. This is, for example, at the very least, you would say, don't go to the temple, or stop using the temple cult, or the, the temple cult won't save you, or whatever. But no, he doesn't even acknowledge the existence of the temple cult. Throughout the whole thing, this speech simply assumes it doesn't exist anymore. And one of the things that Allison pointed out is that the three pillars that, that the sermon is constructed of, uh, which is how to obey the Torah, how to pay cult to God, and how to deal with society. Those are the three structural components of the Sermon on the Mount. These were the three pillars that rabbis, after the destruction of the temple, developed to sort of save their religion. Because the, the question became, once the temple cult was destroyed, uh, how do we pay cult to God? We, we don't have a temple anymore. So the rabbis came up, well, we have the three pillars. And they, they came up with the exact same thing. How to obey the Torah, how to pay cult to God, how to deal with society. So to have Jesus giving the exact same speech in his version of this rabbinical response to the destruction of the temple, which implicitly assumes that you can't pay cult to, the, to God through the temple because it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, means that this was written after the destruction of the temple. It was written by someone, not Jesus. So, so much for the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this is myth.